everyone, and welcome to Citizens for Global Solutions Virtual Book Club. Today is Saturday, September 9th, and I'm Drea Bergman, the Director of Programs. I am joined by Gail Hughes, our book club coordinator, who does such a wonderful job of keeping everyone informed of upcoming sessions and readings. I'd also like to introduce James May, CGS's new program officer, who will be our tech support today. So if you have any issues, you can message him or put it in the group chat and he will be monitoring that. And of course, a big, huge warm welcome to our author of today's book, Manu Bhagavan, which I will give a longer bio after housekeeping. So we are recording today's session. It will be available on CGS's YouTube channel by mid next week. And you can always visit and subscribe to our channel to get notifications when the new events are up. And today is the first of four sessions of the book, The Peace Capers, India and the Quest for One World. CGS's book club is an opportunity to read and discuss both classic and contemporary books on world citizenship and world federation in depth, learn unique insights from the authors and have empowering conversations that provide a forum to exchange ideas. Uh, and then I would also, you know, proceeding as usual with our guest author of Manu, um, while he gives the main takeaways, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussions. And as usual, if everyone could go on mute when you're not speaking. And then around 1230, we're going to be jumping into the open question and answer, where you can raise your virtual or physical hands. And something new, we will be monitoring the chat. So if you'd like to put your questions in the chat, please feel free so. And then we can answer your questions on a first come first serve basis. Uh, we will stop the session at around 10 minutes prior, uh, so around 1.20, for any announcements that people may have about relevant events or things that they want to promote. So please hold those kinds of comments until the end, or you can put them in the chat at any time. So now I'm honored to introduce our guest author today, Manu Bhagavan, who is a professor of history, human rights, and public policy at Hunter College and the Graduate Center, the City University of New York where he is also a senior fellow at the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies. He is author and editor of seven books, and I would also love for Manu to plug his upcoming book, uh, which I can't wait to get my hands on after reading the first couple chapters. So James, if you could put in the chat uh, Manu's website so that we all have access to his wonderful scholarship. And also if you're on Twitter, you can follow Manu at, at Manu Bhagavan. So in today's first session, of Manu's book, The Peacemakers. We're now going to hear from Manu and why he wrote the book and being able to get some highlights and insights from the prologue and chapters one and two. So Manu, I'd love to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Drea, for that very kind introduction and um, good afternoon to everyone, at least it's afternoon here on the East Coast. Um, it's very nice to meet all of you virtually. Uh, to be honest, I haven't done one of these Zooms in quite a while now because we reverted back to in-person over here. So uh, it's a little, it just going to take me a second to get to get used to this again, uh, looking at the at the boxes and the screens, um, but it should be quick. Um, uh, Donna introduced me briefly uh, to some of the basics of Citizens for Global Solutions at the outset here. Um, and I'm really pleased to make the connection uh, ever since I wrote this book and, and some related work, um, many people in the World Federalist Movement have been in touch. And David Gallup, uh, I know, has communicated with me over the years many times. And we were together at uh, a conference or two. And um, I spoke at uh, an event that William Pace uh, had had put together, and Joe Schwartzberg is an old colleague and friend. Um, so, and Fernando Iglesias uh, also uh, I work close with. And then there's all kinds of international folks who work on these kinds of issues, including Andreas Bamel, who's very committed to uh, a world parliament, um, and some folks over in Israel and other places. Um, like Oded Gilad, uh, uh, Gilad and so on. So um, so I think I know, I have some familiarity with uh, your group. I, if I don't know each of you personally, at least in terms of the extended network in which you operate. Um, 
and I think David and I were also at a conference recently organized, which was was quite interesting by some, to me, to me, they seemed kids. Uh, they, were, they, they were very young people um, and they were very, very energetic. Uh, yes, with a week of world parliament in New York. Uh, and uh, they had organized this, they had a lot of, they, they had a lot of big hopes for this. It was their first one, but it was in the middle of the pandemic and it was hard to get people to come out, but they made the best of it. They had a good little core group there and uh, and we broadcast it, uh, young, world Federal, young World Federalists, that's right. Uh, and so I was uh, honored to be one of the keynote speakers there as well. Um, so Dre asked me just to mention a little bit about my uh, my other work. I'm a specialist on India as a geographic location, but um, in the in the broader context, I work on human rights, public policy, and international affairs. Um, I've been the chair of the human rights program at Roosevelt House, which is the former home of FDR and Eleanor, uh, which is at Hunter, part of Hunter College, and. The uh, other books that I have done aside from the peacemakers focus on things like India and the Cold War um, and uh, varying kinds of stories about uh, nationalism and internationalism and so on. My new book, uh, which is what she wanted me just to flag, um, is a biography of Madame Pandit, the, one of the lead characters of the peacemakers. Um, and as I as I was reviewing this, it's been a while since I, I wrote this book back in 2012, uh, and it, it's amazing how that now feels like a, a different lifetime. Uh, but uh, when I went back to look over all of this, um, I have it right in the book, but the story is quite a bit different uh, when you when you elaborate and and sort of see all the things. So it's a biography of hers. Um, it's taken me eight years to do, uh, and it is. Going to be good. It's a, it's an it's an it's it's an amazing 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 story. So I'm actually, this is my last weekend for copy edits. They're due on Monday, uh, and the book release is in December. So I'm um, we're off to the races this coming week. Uh, okay, so that's uh, I think enough, right, Freya? Can I? I'll I'll move on now to talk about um, why I wrote uh, the Peacemakers. Uh, well. So the 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 truth of the story is that I, I I'm a historian I'm a professional historian of India, and I had uh, finished my first book and then I'd gone back to India to do some work, and I I was kind of despondent because the state of affairs in the country at the time were were not very good, and it it was such a large gap between some of the ideals at the founding moment and where the country was at that time. And I grew really interested in constitutional questions. I was like, I, I, I wanted to understand the debates about what the country was supposed to be, how it was envisioned, what the law, how, how they framed ideals of a, of a legalistic framework. But a, a constitution is, is yes, it's about the law, but it is also kind of a guiding visionary document. And I wanted to know a little bit more about those things. So my initial idea was to go and investigate the making of India, making of modern India through its constitution. Uh, and the project was called Designing India. In the three chapters you read, you might find that phrase, Designing India, because uh, that initial idea is what grew into this. So I went to the archives and I started, the, the idea was I was gonna look at uh, a, a number of people who worked on the constitution and um, pull out their ideas as they were grappling with various concepts. And the first person that I started with was Hansa Mehta, who was, um, you haven't encountered her in this book yet, but she's she's in this book also, uh, in, in The Peacemakers. Um, but she had appeared in my first book uh, and she was someone who played a pivotal role in India's, she played an important role in India's constitution. So I started there. And as I did that, I started to uncover all of her work at the United Nations, about which at the time I knew nothing. So I found this really fascinating. Now, this is going to be very embarrassing. But then at that, around the same moment, my uh, colleague of mine named Jonathan Rosenberg 
had written his own book about civil rights in the US. And he he started talking to me about Madame Pandit. And he kind of gave me this knowing look as if I, I should know everything about her. And the truth is I had no idea what he was talking about. I, I, I looked at him like he was from Mars. I, I was like, what? Ma who, Madame Pan I had no idea who, he, who she was until I sort of eventually pieced it together that it was Vijay Lakshmi Pandit um, from India. But even then, other than the fact that she was Nehru's sister, I didn't know anything about her. I mean, I knew nothing. I, she wasn't, she was, she was a, a sibling and nothing more to me. Uh, and so I, when I was looking at this Hansa Mehta papers, I said, well, let me just look at this other thing. And then my head exploded because I just couldn't believe what was in this story. And the biggest of all of the stories was this kind of the, the thing that I couldn't quite piece together was this recurring phrase, one world. And I didn't know what it meant. Uh, and I, the, the project very quick, quickly shifted away from the constitution making project to being interested in this concept and, and to uncovering uh, what, it, what they were talking about, what their goals were, what they wanted. Um, and that had never been talked about anywhere before. Uh, and so I was confused. You know, the Indian movement was considered a nationalist movement. One World, as I was understanding it in these papers, was not a nationalist movement. It was an internationalist movement. It was a critical of nationalism. So there were all of these elements there that I was a, a bit befuddled by. I pieced all of that together, and that eventually is what led me into this deeper story. I, I published an article version, an academic article version of it, and that went, um, it skyrocketed to number one in this uh, academic journal. Um, and got a lot of traction very fast. And um, anyway, uh, and then I, I managed to land a contract with Harper Collins to write this book, and uh, and that's how that's a story of how this book came to be. Um, okay, so I told Drea that I can spend an hour and a half just telling you all about my name or something like that because I'm an academic. It's not hard to fill time. So I, I'm going to move on uh, because I think I only have about another, am I right, about 15 minutes, Drea, to, to, to do the basics. You know, if, yeah, if you need longer, like don't don't let the our run of show hold you back from from sharing your insights. Oh, no, never tell an academic that they have as much time as that they want. No, 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 no. I have 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to stick to that. Uh, OK. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we'll, 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 uh, we'll, I'll try to be concise. So um, my understanding is that all of you have read the first three chapters of The Peacemakers. That's the prologue, chapter one and chapter two. Um, and so I'll just kind of pull out some nuggets. I'm not gonna bore you with the very detailed kinds of summaries because I presume that you've all, you've all gone through it. Um, in essence, uh, the first chapter is a is a broad overview. This is what the, the, the these are this is the context for the events of what's happening, uh, and this is what led Indian leaders uh, to take certain kinds of actions. Um, and then it's a setup for, and I I hope I've left it at a dramatic pause, um, where you, you this you sort of drives up to this moment for this is what they want, and it's this big amazing thing, and you know then there's all this stuff in the way. Uh, and so what happens? Um, and then uh, the um, first chapter was uh, one of the hardest to write um, because I have to cover so much ground so fast. And it's a big, broad, sweeping international context chapter. So I'm talking about World War II. Uh, I I'm talking about the context of what's going on there and uh, uh, talking about um, the reaction in India to those events uh, and how India sees itself in the context of World War II. Uh, and then the second chapter, well, that was my favorite of the book to write. That's India and New York. I live in New York. I work in New York. Um, I'm partial to New York. Uh, so just from that perspective, I, I was like, I was very, I, I thought it was fun. Uh, but of course, the big thing is that uh, I enter Madam Pandit, which is how it, it starts. So her, her name is Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, uh, anglicized, it's Madam Pandit. 
so I, I can go either way in, in, in the pronunciations. Um, I'm just using Madame Pendant as a comfort zone in, in, in talking here. Um, so since my new book is a biography of hers, I, I mean, I will stick to this narrative, but I'm also happy, you know, like the, there's a lot of detail that's not in this chapter that that's uh, that's that's part of this larger story. Um, OK, so let's just walk through um, the the elements here, this the, the, the sort of key takeaways. Um, so. The purpose of the prologue. Um, in the context of the preface as well, is to set up that this is a story when it was written, which is a which is a major challenge to the way people have long understood the Indian anti-colonial movement and the vision and efforts of two of its primary leaders, Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, who became India's first prime minister. Uh, Gandhi, Nehru, and collectively the movement as a whole have long been identified as a nationalist movement. Um, and that means that people viewed this as, a, 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 as an effort to gain independence from Britain for their country, something along these lines. Um, and if, that, that's problematic at a number of, in an, at a number of levels because what is this country and who's envisioning it and what were the borders and how do you establish a pattern of sovereignty, sovereign over what, what is the, the legacy, the continuity of these kinds of things. So these are more academic kinds of, uh, you know, deep questions, but, but those are some of the problems of what's involved um, with thinking of this as a nationalist movement. It could have been, it was just stuff that had to be explained and never really had been fully. But what I challenge in the prologue or set up as the challenge of the book in the prologue is that that's not who they were at all. Uh, and that people just have it all wrong. Um, and that in fact, uh, what they were were critics of nationalism. Now, by being a critic of nationalism, it doesn't mean that that they held, uh, that, that, that they were looking for the negation of all nationalism. Nationalism served a purpose, it had a place, um, and that it could have certain functions that were useful. But nationalism, like all things taken to its furthest conclusion, could be dangerous. So it needed to be capped, uh, and they proposed uh, an internationalist solution. I think it's fair to ask immediately, therefore, did they wonder if internationalism taken to its furthest conclusion might also be dangerous? Um, and, you know, how did they envision capping that? Um, so while I, we can explore that over the various sessions, I think, but I think the main takeaway for us is that uh, their conclusion was that balance is the key. You always need to balance the needs of the individual with the needs of the group. You need to balance the needs of the local with the needs of the, um, the regional. You need to balance the regional with the needs of the, of the national. You need to balance the needs of the national with the international. Uh, and so these different scales have uses um, and you you don't want to just do away with them completely um, because uh, there are different ways at which they become responsive or representative of the people at their various levels. So I think that's the key um, of, of their approach, uh, and we'll see that and discuss it. Whether or not they're right is a different story, but that's the that's their that was their um, main mission. The other part of the prologue. Uh, basically just introduces uh, some of this, uh, you know, gives a quick snapshot of the story that they intend to do all of this, how are they going to do it, that it overlays with the creation of the United Nations. Um, and they saw the United Nations as potentially an asset, but there was a problem with seeing it this way because, well, it had a predecessor organization, the League of Nations, and the League of Nations didn't turn out that way. Um, and imperialism had a long foothold. So the 
other issue here is just this role of imperialism that comes through more clearly in chapter one. Um, the ending part of the prologue just sort of walks us through um, the end of World War II and I sort of dance around this idea here in the prologue, but it picks up steam later in the book, um, this idea of human rights. So the book is also about human rights um, and it's about the foundation of human rights, which also uh, at the time the book was written, uh, in my view, had been terribly misunderstood in terms of both their conceptualization and their history. Um, and uh, so I make a case here that we need a very different understanding of human rights. That's something I think we can talk about later because I get into those details uh, in later chapters. But I also flag it for you because it's mentioned here when I talk about Nuremberg. Um, I, I, I sort of say that this is something that gets popularized. So that's a, a an element of foreshadowing. Uh, okay, I'm going to speed up this this last little bit. Um, World War II. Um, I. I think I understood from the message that was sent out that um, what I did here was interesting to many of you because um, it, perhaps it isn't as common to see World War II from this perspective, which is the perspective of a country like India, which seems either irrelevant or on the margins. Um, and uh, what I was trying to do in this chapter was to show that it was actually very important um, at a certain point in the war uh, and that it it played a, it, an important um, role in people's imaginations around the world. Uh, and uh, many of the world's most important political figures on the Allied side also saw India as a, an important pivot point. Um, so this chapter introduces a bunch of people who play an important role in the book. Uh, this includes... Um, um, the people like uh, Shang Kai Shek and Madam Chang, um, uh, FDR, uh, and some other people uh, in India as well. Um, the pivot point of this chapter is what I call the crisis of imperialism, um, and this question of this of the point of it all. Um, World War II was, uh, in in many ways, talked about as uh, a moral war because it was fought for bigger principles and those principles were about equality, justice, freedom, and so on. Um, and many people really believe this. Um, and that was why India was so important to it. Because if that's why, if that's what the war was being fought over, then that is what had to be delivered at the end of the war. And you couldn't keep up these inconsistencies um, uh, for much longer, but there were plenty of inconsistencies. Um, and so this uh, chapter one culminates in what's called the Quit India Resolution. Um, and that's this, the, Gandhi has three major campaigns, um, non-cooperation, civil disobedience, and Quit India. Quit India is the third and last of his campaigns. Um, and he, it, as I'm describing it to you, is how it is most commonly understood as Gandhi's movement. This was Gandhi's Quit India uh, movement. But in point of fact, Gandhi's resolution was not the one that was adopted. It was Nehru's. Um, and Nehru's resolution for Quit India was really all about World War II. It basically was saying, so Quit India is understood in the Indian context and not considered at all in the international or World War II context. Quit India is seen as Gandhi's call for Britain to quit India and he's arrested and, and that's kind of all that people understand it as. But in point of fact, the Quit India resolution was a war, res and was a war resolution. It said, India stands firmly with the allies. We call on Britain to leave, make us independent, and an independent India vows to fight on the side of the allies uh, to defeat fascism throughout the world and then to help win the peace. And to win the peace, the Quit India Resolution calls for the establishment of a world federation of independent states. Uh, and this is very important because this is the foundational document that then 
becomes the basis for moving forward with independence thereafter. Um, and it is a guiding visionary document. It's certainly what gets written by Nehru, and it's the guiding vision that he has all the way through from this point forward. So uh, I think that uh, that's the main, that, that that's the most important element of this, the um, August 8th, 1942, uh, quit India resolution, the wording of that, and, uh, and what happens. All the leaders are then put in jail, uh, and so the next um, the next chapter, since the leaders of the Indian anti-colonial movement are in jail, uh, the next chapter is then about Madame Pandit. She too was put in jail, uh, and it tells you a little bit about her backstory uh, and uh, introduces her a little bit. I find it funny to read this now because um, the snapshot, while it's correct, is it's, it's missing a lot. Um, uh, and so there, there's a lot of uh, very, very amazing things. Uh, just to give you one snapshot of what I'm talking about so you understand a little bit more clearly, uh, I hurried through some stuff here and say, oh, yeah, she was, uh, you know, she was in Czechoslovakia for the Sudan crisis. And um, Oh yeah, she was uh, in in um, in England uh, uh, when Neville Chamberlain said you know something, and um, so I, I kind of passed through this very quickly. But what I don't say, uh, I went largely because I didn't know at the time. Um, well, she wasn't just in Czechoslovakia. I mean, she met the Czech government. She she talked with them. Uh, she was she was pretty important to them. And she was staying right next door to Lord Runciman of the Runciman mission, which was there to kind of negotiate the peace. So, uh, and then she wasn't just in England. I mean, she was she was outside 10 Downing Street uh, when Chamberlain is uh, is talking and, and uh, this is the moment of um, peace for our time and so on. Uh, and then she, plays a pretty significant role, I'd say, after that, because she then delivers some important remarks, um, which uh, I think have been completely erased, but I think people will find amazing because it's uh, it's uh, transformative to a very important and well-known moment in history right after that. Um, so there's, uh, anyway, this book just kind of uh, passes through this very fairly quickly um, uh, and gets through some of the history uh, to, to explain how she gets out of prison for her health, um, how Madam Chang is in India. Uh, Madam Chang is a graduate of Wellesley College. Um, she, they, they make a connection. Um, oh, the book leaves off some interesting things because I introduced Wendell Wilkie and uh, his One World Tour. Um, and I say that uh, in the One World Tour, you know, he's in, he meets the Changs and he's very impressed by them. And, and that's the reason he does things. What I left out in the book at the time, also because I didn't know, um, but now I do, is that he was having an affair with uh, Madame Chang. So that uh, was part of what that, that was all about. Um, that there are other elements of those kinds of things that are not in this book, but there are people who are involved with that kind of stuff also going on in the background. Um, so uh, Madam Chang and uh, Mrs. Pandit hit it off in India uh, and um, she Chang convinces her to send her daughters, Madam Pandit's daughters, Mrs. Pandit at the time she's known as, uh, to the United States to Wellesley to go to college. Um, and then with the help of figures like Pearl Buck and others, this all is arranged. Um, the, uh, the two girls come to the United States uh, and attend Wellesley. She has three daughters um, and uh, all of them go on to do important things, but the middle daughter, Nayantara, goes on to become one of India's most celebrated writers uh, and novelists. Um, she's still alive to this day, now my good friend. Um, right, so, there's things here we can talk about the um, uh, depending on how uh, how much of this is of interest. Uh, she's married. Her husband dies. She's extremely well. She comes from wealth uh, from her family, um, and then she marries into wealth through her husband's family. When she's married, all of her property that she brought in, all of the things that she owned, becomes part of the joint family. But 
under customary law, when she dies, all of it is considered her husband's property and his family then claimed it all, meaning that they wiped her out. She didn't have anything by the time this was over. Uh, and she was left with nothing. So she, um, she sues them, which is also unheard of with India's superstar lawyer. Um, they settle. Uh, and then her brother and Gandhi counsel her to make peace, accept the settlement. Um, she doesn't want to, and she's upset about it, but she does because she was, she goes with what they say. Um, and this helps to define her and some of her actions the rest of her life because she now has to earn a living. Uh, and so she works and uh, and and um, and and works for many decades after this. Uh, so this goes on to talk about the Wilkie stuff, um, uh, the importance of the One World trip and the One World radio address, uh, and then spend some time uh, on her um, on Madame Pandit's tour of the United. Uh, she does a tour in the U.S., but the highlight of it all is her time in New York, uh, and in particular, um, her radio appearance at Town Hall of the Air. Um, and in this uh, program, she debates Robert Boothby. Uh, Robert Boothby was Churchill's parliamentary secretary. He was a pretty important figure because he was Churchill has long has long been he's thought of in the popular imagination as the person who first warned about the dangers of Hitler. But it but it wasn't really Churchill. In fact, it was Boothby, who uh, he was someone who had long been enamored of Germany. Um, and he, uh, you know, well-known Anglophile was interested in both these places. He visited, was horrified, and knew immediately that something was really wrong. And he is the one who sounded the alarm about Hitler. Churchill gets the credit. Um, so Boothby is not a you know small figure here. He's a, he's an important, uh, perceptive, influential uh, person, and he debates Madame Pandit in this in this um, arena. Uh, and as I mentioned, this is a um, this is a high stakes affair because everyone listens to this program, uh, and it's known as a program that um, produces a verbal bloodbath. So you know it's it it really could have gone quite badly, um, uh, and and things could have taken a very different turn if she had stumbled, um, but instead. She completely eviscerates him, uh, and uh, it's just a star-making turn. And suddenly, people all over the United States know who she is, uh, and they she emerges from this kind of nationally in the U.S. known as Madame Pandit. Um, and uh, the story just sort of takes off from there. So that's where we leave these chapters. I think that's a good quick summary. Um, I, I'm not sure how much else to cover. Uh, but I'll, I think I'll leave it there. I'm uh, six minutes over. Oh, no, that's it's perfect. Um, and I, I normally am not vocal when I read books. But when I got to that part of the debate, by the way, I was like shouting, yay. Um, and and uh, my partner had to check on me to make sure everything was OK, because it was just so riveting. Um, and Terry, I see your question. Um, that actually relates to more. Um, uh, current events, which I have plugged in here for the, you know, starting at one. So we'll get to your question first thing around one. But I do want to make sure, you know, related to the book, um, if anyone has any questions, again, you can put them in the chat. Uh, you can raise your virtual or physical hands and I can call on you. I see Gail, David, Joseph. So let's, I see Gail, I think was yours first. I try to do however I see first. So Gail. Take it away. Hi. Um, well, I was struck by um, your. There are a couple of things that showed how histories, when written by global South countries, and by global South I mean countries that had been colonized. Global North being the col countries that had been colonizers. There is a difference in perspective that can be 180 degrees different, and. Um, the, the couple examples were in India's um, interpretation of what caused World War II being imperialism, which no global North country would have thought. And then also the um, way that Churchill was described 
is not the glowing hero that the global north would have. So I think your book is very important and there should be other, I don't know how many histories from other countries there are from the global south that show how different the you know their perspective of things. And I was wondering if you could comment more about that. Maybe some other examples will come up it later in your book. Some other examples of other countries' perspectives? Is that what well, you're Well, or or of India's perspectives, how it would be different than uh, what we would normally hear in the US or Europe. Um, okay, well let's start with that one. That's more my that's more my wheelhouse. Um let's see. Well, India's views are extremely complicated. Also, I'm hesitant to describe anything as India's views because India is a big place sure. um, and there's bazillions of people and different people have different perspectives on things. So there are people who are extremely pro-United States. Let me be clear about this. Uh, actually, this is one of the more complicated things. The United States has a place in people's imaginations in the 1940s that's enormously complex because it is a post-colonial country. And so in a sense, it's representative of the possibility of post-colonialism, of, um, of a post-imperial future. Secondly, you've got FDR who's running around saying big things like signing the Atlantic Charter uh, and proclaiming the four freedoms. And well, the Atlantic Charter is taking the four freedoms globally. Uh, and people know who he is. People know who FDR is and they know what he's saying and he's he's making waves. Uh, so there's that kind of thing. The other thing is Woodrow Wilson. Now Wilson, yes, yes, he's got all of these problems that we know about in the United States, um, but the 14 points, the Global South know the 14 points. And they also understand that some elements of that, they understood the 14 points to be something beyond what Wilson intended. Um, and this notion of self-determination, which was really key there, is, is sort of picked up on. Um, that's the, my colleague at Harvard, Erez Manila, has a book about that. Um, so, let, let's just sort of first understand the United States has this odd positioning and it, it, where people give it a more a bit more leeway than Britain. That is, they're not necessarily lumped together in uh, as as the same thing. S secondly, this bit about Churchill is also extremely complicated because Churchill is seen as a as a very tough enemy of India. No question, um, and uh, is is uh, is uh, uh, criticized and is seen as a critic of India. He's opposed. Um, and there's some stuff that happens with the, this great famine, uh, which is in more recent times brought very harsh criticism. But having said that, Madame Pandit, for example, and Nehru as well, both ultimately come to have very warm relations with Churchill. Um, and, um, and he in turn has extremely <laughs> warm relations with them. Um, and uh, he ends up calling uh, Nehru the light of Asia at the end of his life. So um, there, there's some complexities here that we need to sort of keep bear in mind um, and not paint too broad a stroke uh, about anything. Uh, I, I think maybe what I'll spend a second on expanding, I mentioned it in the book, but but let's talk a little bit more about how India saw the war and saw Hitler. Um, I don't expand on this very much in this book. I've written about it elsewhere, but maybe this might be helpful here and then I'll and then maybe this is what all you're asking. Um, so this notion that World War II is driven by imperialism. So Gandhi in particular writes extensively about how he sees um, Germany, i.e. Hitler, and Britain as two sides of the same coin. Now that statement to anyone in the West is preposterous and 
you know, not 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 even vaguely close. But to people in the global south, um, it rang true uh, and and felt true um, because uh, the difference between an Amritsar massacre or uh, what happened to the Mau Mau uh, and what Hitler was proposing to do was a question of scale. Uh, but in practice, those things were extremely similar. They were very brutal. They were, uh, you know, there was mass violence. There was indiscriminate killing um, and so on. So uh, that's how it's seen for a period of time, two sides of the same coin. Now, in the same breath, Gandhi distinguishes between Britain and other places because he believes, because he's making this comparison, in the West, one would hear this as he's villainizing Britain with the ultimate villain of the 20th century, or maybe of all world, one of the worst villains of all of world history. But that's not what he's doing because Gandhi doesn't see Hitler that way in the period in which he's making these comparisons. And so instead, what he see, says is and sees is that everyone is a byproduct of their times and of these uh, contexts in which they operate. And so what is really happening is individuals should never be blamed uh, and individuals can be forgiven um, if they choose to go the right direction and, and they, and they um, change. Now, they might be really misguided and they might be doing terrible things. And that isn't something that should be let go. They have to change course willingly and then make amends for what they're doing. But you, you also have to be ready to, to accept that and to move on. Um, there are complicated things here that I'm happy to get into if you want me to. Um, so this leads him, which I mentioned here in the book, to, to approach Hitler directly in a series of letters and ask, he refers to him as Herr Hitler and, um, and my friend Hitler, um, and tries to be reasonable with someone who's extremely unreasonable. And um, he, it takes him a while to kind of realize and come to the conclusion that this is not, this is not going to work. Before we dismiss Gandhi completely as a crackpot, one should also understand that there's another important Indian figure named Subhas Chandra Bose, who also goes to meet Hitler uh, and um, get some um, uh, positive feedback from Hitler, winds up creating something called the Indian National Army, embedding it with the Japanese army, and then marches back on India to try to liberate India with the Indian National Army embedded in Japanese forces. So Gandhi is acting in a certain kind of context. That's one thing to keep in mind. Um, it's also important to remember that Mussolini, on several occasions, had reached out to Hitler, uh, sorry, had reached out to uh, Gandhi and to Nehru also to try to draw them in. So these are not, Gandhi is not operating in a vacuum here. Uh, there's a context in which he's operating. At any rate, he quickly realizes, quickly meaning by the early 40s, uh, that Hitler is not this kind of a person and that he's beyond the pale. And I describe him as the Moriarty to Gandhi's homes, the antithesis of Gandhi. Um, and that then takes some time to figure out what to do. And that is what ultimately, I think, leads to um, the Quit India Declaration being, being the way to go. Um, because you have to come up with something bigger to take nonviolence bigger uh, to match against this apostle of violence who Hitler is. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, if I really answered your question very well, that's just some things. There's lots of books written about India and World War II uh, by my colleagues Yasmin Khan or Srinath Raghavan, if you're interested in those sort of more specific perspectives about, you know, how much India participated in the war. It was quite a lot. Um, uh, and what perspectives they brought to it. And Joseph, I believe you're up next in the queue. I'm your mute. You're muted. Sir. Oh, you're on mute. There. Yeah, you're on mute, Joseph. Um, well, uh, Professor Bhagavan, I encountered your book. Uh, some time ago, I am the author of a big history of the World Federalist Movement. Um, and uh, I, I look forward to uh, a book by an Indian who, um, uh, who would um, 
explain how India related to the World Federalist Movement in the West. And and uh, your book does not connect with the movement in the West, with Britain or with the United States. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, uh, you point out that uh, in the Quit India Resolution, uh, why uh, it's plain language that the ultimate goal for the war from uh, Gandhi's and Nehru's point of view was a world federation. And this is very interesting to me because it's uh, quite early, 42. Um, but the British had established a, a group called Federal Union as early as 1939, after Clarence Streit's book, uh, Union Now came out. And the uh, American uh, World Federalists formed as early as 1941 in New York uh, but it strikes me that uh, here was a common uh, notion of high principle that spread about the world, and it's reflected in both these events. But you uh, uh, you seem not to know of them. Uh, the British actually uh, produced uh, influence on Winston Churchill to offer union with uh, France uh, in uh, June of 1940. Uh, now, there's another case here later in the book. I noticed in, in um, on um, page um, 86, there is a reference to uh, a vote in the new United Nations, which India opposed. Um, and in 1946, uh, Grenville Clark, a prominent American, uh, had organized a famous conference called the Dublin Conference, and had called for uh, immediate United Nations reform. Uh, while the iron was still hot, and in 1946, uh, Clark's uh, worker, Alan Cranston, later a senator, um, prevailed upon Cuba to introduce a resolution in accordance with Article 109 to immediately call a review conference of the of the charter, uh, potentially to abolish the veto, um, and this uh, this is one point at which you and I actually had some uh, common agreement. Um, you do point out that India voted no on the Cuban resolution, and uh, I had covered this. And so it is a great setback for the whole process of UN reform uh, very early in UN history. Um, I think that what India did was join in with the great powers, the big three, all of whom opposed this resolution. They didn't want a new conference on the structure of the United Nations. And India did this um, in the um, really uh, while it was preoccupied with independence uh, and uh, uh, before uh, the Cold War developed and India took a non-aligned position. So um, to me, um, the role of, you might know that, well, I don't think you do know, but, um, um, but uh, uh, a prominent British uh, member of parliament, Henry Osborne, had uh, launched a movement to convene a World People's Constitutional Convention. Um, and uh, Osborne had hoped that Nehru might lead this movement outside of the West. But I, um, but Nehru never, uh, although he was sympathetic to the ideal of World Federation, even as late as 1947 or 48, um, he uh, he was un unable to take up the leadership of such a movement to strengthen in the United Nations when he's preoccupied with independence from Britain uh, and the whole uh, the whole struggle against European imperialism. Um, so, uh, frankly, from my point of view, I. Uh, I find it a stretch to think of Nehru as being a, an exemplar of the one world ideal. Um, he didn't link up with the groups in the 
Britain or the United States or the West generally, um, there's never a, a, ever any mention of the issue of the atomic bombs. Um, and um, But Nehru uh, and Gandhi, uh, of course, Gandhi soon uh, was assassinated and, uh, and uh, Nehru found himself in the very difficult position of winning in the Indian independence, constructing a new constitution, which you remark uh, went on from 1946 to 1950, um, and then uh, resisting uh, US pressure to add India to Sento and containment of the Soviet Union. So um, what he, what Nehru, the, the Nehru is really a, Nehru's real credit, it seems to me, was to lead the non-aligned movement, especially at the um, at the conference in 1955, the Bandung Conference. Um, I don't, I don't see that his sympathy for one world was really at work. Uh, he was trying to preserve Indian independence uh, after this struggle against the empire of Great Britain, and uh, then uh, resisting the pressures from the United States to add India to uh, the containment policy. Um, so, um, so um, in short, um, I think the, the claim that Nehru was an advocate of one world is a uh, is pleasant, but it um, really was not serious politics. Um, okay, uh, very nice to meet you, Mr. Barada, and thank you for that, um, all the, a lot of detail in, in that comment and question. One of the nice things about writing a book is to discover all kinds of new things uh, in the conversations that you have afterwards. Uh, so of course I make no pretenses whatsoever, that I know everything, uh, or that uh, uh, that these were necessarily every detail that I thought of ahead of time, um, because this was, especially when you're writing something that's new, you're kind of forging ahead in uh, all kinds of different directions. Also in a global history, there's gonna be all kinds of angles and things that open up. So sure, there's lots of elements of, the, uh, of things going on elsewhere that uh, uh, I, there aren't in the book and that I, didn't know about and I probably still don't know about, uh, although I've learned a lot more since I wrote the book. Um, and uh, I'm, I'd say I'm pretty well versed in quite a few things uh, related to it as well. Um, now, having said that, uh, there sure there's some specifics and, and you name some of them that I'm not still aware of, um, but that is part of the point um, because um, what the perspective of this book is, is based on extensive archival research coming from the Indian perspective uh, and down deep in the weeds uh, in internal deliberations and negotiations. So while it's true that those folks might have been doing things, they were not pertinent or relevant to what was going on in India or, or things that Nehru had in his mind or that he considered. It is true that the world federalists at various points did approach Nehru, different kinds of people who had sympathy for such positions approached Nehru, uh, to, talked about asking him to lead the movement. There are many letters, uh, approaches, appeals, and so on that, that did come his way. And for the most part, he would sort of look at them and in, internally he would say, what am I supposed to do with this? I, I can't get out there and do what they want because I'm, I lead a country and it is complicated to move the needle. You know, I can't just, jump up and down and say these things. It's it's fine for an activist or a citizen uh, to do these things. Let me give you one example, uh, uh, which um, um, David Gallup might, might uh, recall or know. Some of you I'm sure know as well, which is an old acquaintance of mine, um, Gary Davis, the, the first world citizen, uh, has famously written about his venture into India and to meeting Nehru and to talking to him about world citizenship. Nehru meets with him, talks with him. Um, this is very important to Gary. Uh, and he sort of saw this as kind of an important 
turning point inspiration for him uh, and some of the work that he did thereafter. Um, for Nehru, like Gary Davis is a person he meets five seconds, you know, five, like uh, a minute and life moves on because there's, yes, there's a ton of stuff going on. It is absolutely not true that he or anyone in India didn't talk about the atomic bomb. That's that's just an untrue statement. Um, the, the, they're extremely influential in, the, um, in, in all discussions revolving around uh, nuclear weapons, most importantly from basically the, the major physicists of the world continue to see India and Nehru as, as like one of the most important people to try to maintain the peace. Uh, and I, I mentioned some of it here, I deal with it much more extensively and in other work. Uh, so, so that's just a, a not true statement. Um, uh, but everything else, I mean, I think it's certainly true that what is my the basic takeaway I I uh, have from your um, your comments is that there was all of this other stuff going on, um, and you classify this as the World Federalist Movement, and that Nehru wasn't a part of that. Um, it's true. I think that's true. I, I don't. I, that doesn't mean that he wasn't a World Federalist. It means that he wasn't connected to this other stuff. True. Um, it also doesn't mean that that wasn't something that he believed in or advocated or wasn't trying to do on his own. He was. Um, now, how he goes about doing it might be constitutively different from what everyone else thinks, and particularly people in the West who were aiming for world federalism, were hoping for, aiming for, thinking that they could accomplish. But one of the things to keep in mind about something like world federalism is that, in fact, it involves people from all over the world. That's one of the hardest parts. Is that when you the more people you involve with some big vision like this, suddenly they have a different idea, and their idea doesn't necessarily comport with the same idea, and they might want to go in a very different direction. Also, real the world of realpolitik and the world of, um, you know, idealistic writing and talking and discussions, very different. The world of uh, of of activists and uh, ordinary people and the world of big political figures, very different. So he has to operate within the the constraints that are placed upon him, just as each of us do, and just as any individual person in their day had to do as well. We're all constrained by all kinds of things, by social class, by custom, by region, by race. Um, and it takes effort to try to overcome any of these kinds of barriers, histories, and so on, uh, and, and to try to live in a way that goes beyond them. Um, and I think that he certainly, more so than many others, did, did that. I don't want to necessarily go down deep in the weeds about Mr. Nehru. I mean, he was an important figure and he's he's certainly influential. But I think the main takeaway is that this isn't really just about Nehru. As an example, I mean, I don't know if this is the right time. It is one o'clock. Um, and, and actually, the first question on here. No, wait, where did I read this? Someone was asking me something about the G20 somewhere. Mm, I can't find it now. Oh, yeah, here. Uh, there's uh, um, Osha Kula's question. Um, and India recently successfully landed on the moon, which will be huge. Um, thank you. Well done. Oh, okay. Uh, this is just a comment, just pointing out that uh, India is hosting the G20, um, and that. Oh. Apologies. Mano, you're on. Mano, you're on mute. All of a sudden. Oh, how weird! I didn't touch anything. Sorry. Uh, I did that. I apologize. Oh, no, no worries, no worries. Uh, so, so I don't know what you heard me say. I, I just wanted to draw your attention to the G20 for a second. I've kind of lost my train of thought because I don't remember what my, my the exact uh, the exact reason I wanted to do this is. Oh, I know. Yes, I do. Um, so uh, um, the person who is the prime minister of India today. So I'm sorry, this is right, Drea, right? I'm supposed to move to talking about global affairs at any at any rate around one o'clock, too. Yes, and we still have two questions from both David Auten and David Gallup, so I want to also touch on those two. But yes, please continue with the G20 um, okay, train I, of thought. I think that's I, great. Uh, this is a nice transition point because it's useful to responding uh, to, to Mr. Barada's questions um, or comments. Uh, so um, the current prime minister of India is Narendra Modi. Uh, Mr. Modi stands for things that are in opposition to what Mr. Nehru stood for. And he really sees Nehru, Modi sees Nehru as his nemesis, as his enemy. Uh, and he's really out to undo most of Nehru's legacy um, and to kind of erase him from history as much as possible to the extent that he can. I think this, no, no one would dispute this, not least of all Modi. 
Uh, so it's fascinating that if, if you look, India has a, uh, it put out a, a moniker for the G20. And the moniker is one world, one family, one future. Now that's an incredible thing to do because, I mean, when you're out to a race, um, Nehru, and you're going back and, and hearkening back to this phrase that all, really only he had used until my book, and now everyone talks about it again. Um, uh, I might also add, by the way, uh, another comment to Mr. Burada is that the you know since my book came out, I mean it's it's not really any longer disputed because the kind of entire Indian industry of people who lived in Nehru's time would kind of bottle this up because talking about being an internationalist after Indira Gandhi comes into the picture was seen as not the right thing to do. So India kind of becomes more interested in sovereignty and uh, and this kind of thing. So after she enters the picture, this whole stuff is like hidden away. So only after my book came out, the Congress, the Congress party had a huge thing and the former foreign secretary, the head of the Congress, they were all there and they, they sort of talked about my work uh, and and kind of everybody just sort of said, oh yeah, that's what it is. So it's not really disputed in in, in India anymore. That this is what was the it was the the goal and what they were talking about. And it's witnessed most clearly by the fact that this phrase is used here now. That phrase, one world, one family, from Modi's perspective, yes, it's Nehru because MEA, Minister, the Ministry of External Affairs, is the one who's writing stuff like this, and they all know my work. Uh, but it's a twist. And this is where it gets fuzzy. And also, uh, Mr. Barada, to clear up some of the things I think you were talking about, about what comes first, where. So from the perspective of the right wing in India, the issue is not Wendell Wilkie as the source of notions of one world or any of these kinds of things, but it is an ancient Hindu concept called Vasudeva Kutumbakam, which is the same thing, one world, one family. Um, and so that notion that Modi has put out now, one world, one family, is the ancient Hindu concept, Vasudeva Kutumbakam. And so in the Hindi of, G, of the G20, it's referred to as that, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, not one world, one family. So you, in other words, for Modi, Modi is always going back to ancient India and saying, look, this is the source of everything. And we have this sort of longer lineage. Um, and we don't need to just sort of go here or there or the West or anything like that. Nehru was I don't think Nehru was uh, unaware by any means of this concept. In fact, he was drawing on that as well. He saw that as resonance. And that's one of the reasons why that concept then had such valence. And my book subsequently has had quite incredible valence with the right wing. I, it just has uh, in India because it fits in with their vision as well. Um, and some of the things that they've said and, and talked about this notion of 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 Vasudeva Kutumbakam, for example. Uh, okay, so I think that's, uh, I, we should probably move on to um, uh, Mr. Uh, I, well, whoever great. Yep. Uh, yeah, next. we'll go in our order. So Dave Auten, David Gallup, and then um, uh, I believe there's a question in the chat from Terry. And so that's our order. So go ahead and Dave. Okay, um, Professor, you use the word, uh, World, Feder World Federation for Gandhi and for Nehru. I'm w wondering, first of all, did they actually use the word federation or is that what you use to describe their ideal of one world? Because uh, modern world federalists would distinguish between confederation and federation. And Nehru's support for the United Nations would be confederation, not federation. And even other language that goes with that, for example, international concern would match confederation, but globalism would match federation. So this is a semantic question, and I'm wondering whether Gandhi and Nehru actually use the word federation, or that's just maybe what you thought they meant. No, nope, they use the word federation. And do you think that they understood those distinctions between uh, United Nations confederation and a world federation. 100%. Okay. They absolutely distinguished between different kinds of sovereignty. They were talking about the, most importantly, the thing to recognize is that it isn't just about talking about these, the unions, 
mechanisms of union is one thing, but you th this has to be placed in the context of understanding what nationalism is about, what it produces, and what is the nature of something called a nation state. And they talk about it. Uh, they use the term nation state, and they talk about the problem of the nation state. And let's also be clear that it wasn't just Nehru and it wasn't just Gandhi. Rabindranath Tagore talks about, hang on, I lost the person I was talking to. Where did he go? Oh, there you are. Oh, sorry. You just suddenly, oh, you pulled down your hand. That's why you, you moved on my screen. Um, uh, it wasn't just Nehru and Gandhi talking about these things. Rabindranath Tagore, for example, was uh, had written an essay uh, critiquing nationalism. Sarojini Naidu, the Nightingale of India, had written extensively uh, about nationalist and internationalist kinds of issues. And by the way, this goes way back before the 40s and the 30s. This stuff goes back to the early 20th century. Uh, so this is, th there are longstanding traditions here talking about these kinds of concepts and critiques of nationalism, the limits of the nation state. And Nehru is also writing about these things in his, uh, in his various work. Um, and so um, the stuff I'm talking about here because of what I was interested in when I wrote this book has certain kinds of context. This book came out in 2012. It's based on an article I wrote in 2008. And I have reams of publications that then have come out since then because this then became my thing and everyone was asking me to say something. And each time I tried to say something new. So I've added many layers to this in subsequent essays and, and articles, which I don't know that you'd want to track any of that stuff down, but but it's all, it's all spelled out in those places. Um, so uh, for example, I'll just tell you, uh, um, there's a, in my field, there's a famous scholar named Partha Chatterjee. He's just retiring. We have a big conference for him at Columbia or they're holding a big conference for him at Columbia next week. Um, and he's a famous scholar of nationalism. So uh, an academic journal did a whole thing on Partha Chatterjee and I was asked to be one of the respondents and I wrote this whole piece about Gandhi and internationalism. And there I also helped to kind of move the time frame back quite a bit to talking about what they were to explaining what this meant. And, um, you know, obviously 1919 is a big pivot, early point for Nehru, although Sarojini Naidu and, uh, and Tagore can go before that as well. 1919 is a good point of origin for this kind of conversation between Gandhi and Nehru. Um, but then what's important is that um, from that point, Gandhi starts thinking about it's internationalism, but it's also what cosmopolitanism means. Um, and he has all of this sort of uh, stuff about it as well. Um, so uh, let's be clear about a couple of things. As you read the book, you'll see uh, the notion that one world meant world federation is explicit. And so we're, it's not something I'm making up. I don't make any kind of innuendo. I have every single thing has backed up hard evidence to the extent possible. Uh, and that's, um, I did I struggled to get that smoking gun and I got the smoking gun. I was very happy that I did and it, it's there in the book. Uh, and uh, so once I can establish that that's what one world signifies, uh, I can also go back then and then find instances of Gandhi using the phrase one world, for example, and we know what he means to an extent. Gandhi, by the time he's right in 1942, I mean, he, yes, he understands the, con the concept, but practical applications of these things is, you know, it varies from person to person and 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 uh, it, the devil's in the detail. So that's where I think, again, a lot of this, uh, and coming back to Mr. Barada's uh, critique. Oh, by the way, I also want to make clear, Mr. Barada, that was a great comment. Uh, I'm, I, I, I don't want to indicate anything else. I, I absolutely think it's terrific that you've so substantially engaged with with the, the thing and that you have a different perspective and that there's reams of details that I haven't dealt with and that uh, that you have, I think that's great. I think the important thing is to put that stuff in conversation, uh, you know, and, and uh, my view on this is never to be overly defensive of any of my work or my ideas, because that isn't the point. Uh, I think the point is to try to get to the the, the heart of the matter and, and the story and um, the only way to do that is to have open and frank conversations and discussions and, and to kind of seek the truth. Um, and the way you do that is to be open to it. Uh, David, I think is the last question. And then the ones in the well, comments. We got, David's got his hand raised and then I've got one uh, comment from Terry in question. So we'll go David Gallup and then I'll, I'll read Terry's question. Yeah. 
Hey, Manu, it's great to see you again. Uh, you. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. We all do. Um, how much effect do you think the creation of the United Nations had on the ind uh, independence of India? It's, it's almost like a hypothetical question. If there hadn't been a United Nations, would uh, India's independence have perhaps been delayed? So I have some um, really good friends, Tom Weiss and um, Dan Plesch, uh, who've been who've done some important work. I mean, kind of the work on the United Nations and and uh, and and many of its founding elements. And Tom has uh, uh, also written a, a number. He's produced a number of edited volumes with a lot of sort of detailed essays on these points. And obviously us at Ralph Bunch, this is something that we think about also. Um, I'd say that my understanding of the consensus point on this is that the United Nations, first of all, um, euphemism for the allies uh, in World War II, but secondly, it, it isn't just that, it's that, that this is Dan's book. Uh, when the United Nations is created, you know, it's bringing a lot of the infrastructure of the league forward. So I think we want to be a little bit careful about over idealizing anything, including the Indians or, or Nehru or anyone, um, but that uh, the, the league was an imperial organization. And my other, my other colleague at Columbia, Mark Mazauer, for example, has written about this. Uh, in his book, No Enchanted Palace. So um, the, um, first thing I'd say is that the United Nations in its initial conceptualization, that is the infrastructure, the way Dan Flesch talks about it as an organization that exists before we think of it as its mo at its moment of establishment. So what Dan is saying is that the euphemism idea of the United Nations, that it means the allies is not really accurate, that the United Nations existed and functioned during World War II. And the way it did is because many of the arms of the league were operating and that these were the same bureaucracies, they changed, but they but they 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 translate into the things that happen after. So the, the claim is essentially that these that that it's operating. OK, so so the in which case I think it's important to say that the United Nations in this period and, and in the immediate conceptualization continues to have all of the imperial artifice uh, uh, um, elements that uh, it, the predecessor league had as well. In which case I wouldn't say it's fair to say that uh, India's independence is either due to or derivative of the United Nations. I'd say, no, that's probably got it backwards. Um, the United Nations, as we understand it, as an organization dedicated to bigger ideals, in fact, I don't need to guess this, I know this as a fact, um, which I think you'll see in chapter four, the new hope, what is that? Oh yeah, that's in a bit. Um, well, you'll see it over the course of the next two chapters that we read in the book, uh, when we talk about um, uh, the showdown in San Francisco and, and the new hope. Um, which is they play a very important role uh, at the outset of the United Nations in and in and it's and at the conference establishing it in making the case that it has to be more universal, uh, it has to speak to bigger ideals, uh, and it has to stand for bigger values. Uh, and then they they it they don't just say these things; they win a big case, and then that becomes important to the essential value of the of that case. Yeah. So I, uh, I'd say, um, if I understood your question correctly, David, if I haven't, of course, just let me know um, that I, I the United Nations at at its moment of conceptualization is influenced by not India per se, but by important Indians. Fine, it's India also. I mean, it, I, I mean, yes, it's both. But I, for me, I, I just always like to distinguish the representatives of India. It's true, uh, and it's 
was influential in the making of modern India, as you'll see also in the book, because of what it symbolized and therefore as they fabricate India, as they create it constitutionally, they're drawing on the ideas behind the United Nations. Uh, and there's this kind of parallel set of conversations going on between what is human rights and what are, how do you, how do you constitutionally create something at an international level between all of these states? And how do you do that in India? And one of the reasons why is because in the constitute what becomes the constitution of India, India is conceptualized as, guess what? A union of states. Uh, and so it's not seen as it, it, it is a it, it's a bit different. And if that sounds familiar, it's not uh, at all incidental. It's because the U India is drawing direct inspiration from the United States, uh, from the Federalist Papers. Um, and, um, and Nehru is sort of engaging with many of those base conceptualizations at the same time as he's thinking about things at the international level. So all of this is sort of worked together and wound um, sort of woven together. Uh, to result in my answer to your question being, India is influential to the creation of the United Nations. The United Nations as an idea as it emerges is influential to the establishment of India. Yeah, just a quick follow-up. So, because when I was reading the book, I just felt like there, uh, at least Madam Pandit was using the creation of the United Nations to say, look, if we're going to be really united, uh, if mm -hmm. we're going to, to have peace, well, that also relates to India having its own independence. It, it, you know, we can't, it, you know, being a part of the UN as its own independent state, not part of the British Empire. Uh -huh. um, I yeah, maybe that's just a wrong interpretation. <laughs> yeah. No, no, I I think that's fair. I mean, I, I think that's fair. If I've understood your point. She, sorry, sorry, just just a minute. Just repeat that last sentence. Yeah, I was saying that I, I thought Madam Pandit was using the this fact that there should be this United Nations to say, well, uh, India as it you know as its own independent country to be a member of that United Nations. I mean, it's almost like there's a hypocrisy between you know this ideal of this United Nations, but then India being you know uh, controlled by an empire and colonized or whatever and not and not have its own independence if you're talking about human rights or uh moving humanity forward i, I hope well, I I myself oh, there. yeah 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 you know no absolutely she definitely is using this this uh the right she's using this moment of the un conference to mm, charge at the british and reveal some of the hypocrisy of what's going on on the irony of india being talking India has a seat at the United Nations conference kind of as a legacy because it, it had a, it, because of its role at, at the league. Uh, and that's why it's able to sit there. But the people who sit there are essentially British representatives. So she's you're a little bit ahead of where where we are in the in the reading. But so she is coming at it a bit differently. So by nature, what her position is, she's going to be critiquing that. But also the point is to say, but you're all talking about all this stuff. And well, we're not even independent. And what are you talking about? Um, and so, um, but look, I think, uh, I think the point here is that, and I, I don't think that this is a small one, um, which is you cannot talk, you can't distinguish between the independence of a colonized territory and the creation of an internationalist ideal. Um, and I think uh, one of the earlier comments seemed to indicate that these were two separate things, that if you're focused on independence, that you can't be focused on or aren't focused on these bigger kinds of questions. And to that, I would say that that's not only is that not right, but that misses the point entirely, which is that, in fact, you have to be focused on independence and the, the the nature of discrimination and oppression and control through something like imperialism, you have to be targeting those things and undermining that for there to be any kind of true envisioning of a, of a bigger globalism or federalism for that to mean anything other than the re-imposition of imperialism. Let's remember that imperialism itself is an internationalist system. 
imperialism is a form of internationalism. It's called imperial internationalism, as opposed to liberal internationalism or progressive internationalism. Again, Mark Mazauer has written about this. So uh, just because something is international or we use the word international doesn't make it good. Um, you know, you, 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 the, the point, the context, the aim, um, you know, uh, all of this is, is very, is, is very critical to what is going to become out of this, is going to come out of this. And I've got uh, one question from, um, actually two questions from Terry I want to uh, get to from the chat. And then uh, I also want to introduce Rebecca Shoot, our new executive director. Um, she also has a question. So the two questions from Terry uh, Manu is uh, related to the 1950 constitution. So he recalls that an educational policy that permitted religious and ethnic groups to create their own schools. Do you know if that provision is still there? And the second uh, is how does that square with Modi's pressure on ethnic and religion, uh, religious minorities in other ways? The best of my knowledge, that provision is there. Um, religious and ethnic minorities are allowed because of the nature of secularism in the country. They are people are allowed to have. They are protected and allowed to have um, individual attention. To the best of my knowledge, although quite frankly, there's been a lot of undermining of things in a whole variety of ways uh, in more recent years, uh, and I wasn't not aware of anything before that. I'm not clear if in certain locations some of this has been undone in certain ways. I don't think so, but at, at local levels, uh, at, at least in practice, there's definitely been backsliding. That part is true. Whether or not it's formally been done, in practice it's being done, that's true. And I think that's the part of the second question. How does this square with Modi's pressure on ethnic and religious minorities in other ways? <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, I, it's 124. I mean, I could do a whole other session on this. That's a, that's a different, that's a, that's a whole can of worms here. Um, Narendra Modi, the prime minister, is a Hindu nationalist. I mean, this, these are not controversial statements. He would be the first person to say that he is a Hindu nationalist. Uh, he is a lifelong member of what's known as the RSS the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which is an arm of the Hindu right. Um, the RSS, also just historical facts, these are not any mysteries, the RSS opposed Gandhi during his lifetime and eventually was banned at the time of independence as an organization complicit, at least, in his assassination. Um, and the RSS has tried to uh, refer have tried to refurbish its image several times uh, since it came out of the ban. Um, but the RSS is part of a whole family of right wing organizations, uh, right wing religious organizations. It's not just right wing; it's it's right wing and religious, and specifically Hindu religious. Um, and this Hindu right wing religious view is for a type of Hindu revivalism. Uh, it's about a celebration of an ancient Hindu India and a glorious pure past. And this shouldn't surprise anyone in the sense that this is a common trend around the world that's been going on now for a while, uh, actually since not too long since after my this book came out, this, the resurgence of kind of a global right a global nationalist right. We call them the, the International League of Nationalists. Um, and so um, this too is something that I, I've written about. And in fact, I was the first person to my knowledge, I'm, I'm credited as such, to write about the rise of global authoritarianism in the world um, before pre preceding 2016. Um, and so um, I'm not too sure what to say. I, I mean, I think in, in, it's of a kind of what's happening elsewhere when you have um, a very driven, specific form of nationalism um, being embraced, that the, that the unsurprising byproduct of that 
is the marginalization and targeting of everyone who doesn't fit into the view uh, espoused by that particular frame of nationalism. Uh, and whether those people are ethnic, the people who are marginalized are religious minorities or ethnic minority, minorities being the presumption, although in some places one can have a, a minority being the one in charge and the majority being uh, being um, uh, targeted and harmed. But but in, in this case, it just we use the term minority in general, it can be religious minorities, ethnic minorities, uh, or other kinds of um, let's put it this way, marginalized communities uh, can be targeted uh, and uh, and further marginalized or or excluded. Um, and, you know, uh, some tried and true methods are then deployed, scapegoating, um, jingoism, and xenophobia, they all go hand in hand. And if that rings some eerie bells, and some warning signs for things that happened earlier in the 20th century, well, it should. Um, because, you know, we know, we know, we know. So uh, I think I'd just leave it at that. And I'd like to, uh, for our last comment or question, um, Rebecca? Uh, thank you so much. Well, let me take the opportunity to thank Manu and apologize to everyone. I hope that my apologies were extended by Drea um, or others. Um, I have switched over from another call, but this is so wonderful to have you here with us. I think actually my comment was pretty, or question was pretty well addressed in um, Manu's last response. Um, I was going to take the example of the use of the placard of Bahrat um, uh, at the G20 summit and the, the name in, in, um, for a decolonized India in a sense, but also one with high Hindu associations. Um, so does this lead us further towards one world or away from one world in the associations that Modi gives it? Um, I think we could probably and hopefully will also explore some territorial disputes that um, are ongoing to this day that are gestured to in the book, maybe in a few later chapters. Um, as well as the event that I just got off of was um, nu nuclear disarmament. So it's very interesting to uh, contemplate how India asserting itself in a new global ecosystem where nuclear power gets you a seat at the table or could get you a seat at the table um, uh, and, and the Security Council, et cetera, um, led to um, an, an, uh, an escalation of arms. Um, so I'm just trying to tap these themes that we've been exploring in some of our advocacy at CGS into your wonderful book. And thank you so much again for being here. And my apologies, I guess it's more a comment than a question because I know that we're also at time, um, but really look forward to engaging with the work um, in greater length. And thank you everybody, of course, for being here, um, old friends and maybe a couple new faces. Um, so thank you, Jaya, also for your able moderation. And uh, I think, uh, did you want to have like a couple last uh, comments, Manu, before we wrap up and um, announce well, announcements? We a, thank you. Uh, we have, since we have a couple sessions more, I, I don't, I yes. think it's okay. We can, we can sort of punt. I just wanted to make sure I understood one thing you said, Rebecca, sorry, uh, which is, you said the placard. Did, did you mean at the B H A R A T Bharat? Is that what you were saying? Yes, I'm sorry about my pronunciation. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, that's not the. I just wanted to make sure I was understanding the point. Um, so that's a big issue. Mm, completely. I think it's better to talk about that in maybe the next session or something because I can't answer it fast. Uh, and we can we can get into that later. Yeah. Great. Thank you so, so, so much. And I think this also plays into the nested identities of federalized states that become part of global federalism and um, how, of course, minority communities, as you gesture to, and vulnerable groups, um, not, not just what we commonly conceive of as minority communities, um, play a role therein. Uh, so I'd like to open it up to announcements uh, very briefly. Does anyone would like to share um, any announcements either in the chat or you can unmute yourself? 
Seeing none, um, I would like Gail to kind of give us a rundown for next month and the date and the chapters that we're reading. So Gail, over to you. Yes, so we'll meet again next month at the usual time and, and date. That is the second Saturday of the month uh, from noon to 1.30 Eastern time. That will be Saturday, October 14, and we'll focus on chapters three and four. Showdown in San Francisco and The New Hope are those chapters. And um, I'll send um, you know reminders as usual, including the links to the free PDF, which is very helpful. Wonderful, thank you, Gail. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Um, this was wonderful. Thank you, Manu. Um, I think I will, we can close out this session now. Um, Manu, if you'd like to stay around, if you can, for a quick debrief. And sure. thank you, thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye.